In the Bible, it gives us hundreds of references to fear, and worry and anxiety really are synonymous here. And many of these references actually command us to fear not, which means that we can't just be praying, God, take away my fear, because He commands us not to fear. Dealing with worry is very difficult for several reasons. It's difficult because it seems so normal and so responsible for us to be thinking about the things that weigh upon us. And in fact, it seems so normal, it seems so much that we are at home with it, that we might even just dismiss it as a personality quirk, or that's just the way I've always been, or that runs in our family, or it's a family trait. And it's difficult to deal with. It seems so normal to us. And it feels so responsible. Worry is difficult to deal with because it is unseen, so it's rarely challenged by other people. It's difficult to deal with because it very quickly becomes a habit, a lifestyle. And it seems to take on a momentum of its own. And we lay in bed at night and we just can't stop our mind. And it just keeps going and going and going and going. And it makes it very difficult to deal with. Worry is difficult to deal with because it isn't often addressed biblically when we do try to deal with it. And then we give up. So we want to see what Paul has to say about it. We, we have to deal with it. There are scores of commands in the Scripture telling us to fear not and to not be anxious. But anxiety is an equal opportunity killer. It is very destructive. And uh, in fact, both the, the English words worry and anxiety come from Anglo-Saxon terms, which mean to strangle. And it really can do that. It strangles so many things for us. And it is a killer. It kills peace and quiet in our soul. A worrier's mind is never at rest. There are always loose ends to tie up. There are always more things to be thinking about him before he can feel he's at rest or he can feel safe. Its peace killing is felt when we develop perfectionism or obsessions or compulsions and we just can't ever seem to rest. Then it can torture a person with an overly sensitive conscience because he worries that he did something wrong before God and, and maybe God won't forgive him of this thing and, or that God hasn't forgiven him or that he isn't even saved and worry is a peace killer. Worry, it kills joy. A worrier can't enjoy normal life. There are too many uncertainties to really be enjoying things as they come. You can't even go to a birthday party of your friend without worrying because you're worried that maybe he won't like or he or she won't like the gift that you bring them or maybe the people that the other people he invited won't like you. And you can't even enjoy a normal celebration because you're worried. And it, a worry is a joy killer. Worry kills our health. A worrier can't sleep well, has trouble digesting, can't recover from normal illnesses well. And anxiety is at the root of eating disorders and panic attacks and many endocrine malfunctions and many gastrointestinal disorders and many cardiac difficulties, including heart palpitations and even high blood pressure. And doctors will tell you this is a health killer. It kills relationships. Relationships are built on trust. And a worrier can't trust. Can't even trust God. He doesn't feel like he can open up to people or, re or reach out to people and worry then becomes a relationship killer. And then lastly, it's a, it kills opportunities. And in, in the more extreme situations, a worrier might avoid being in public or might avoid sitting in the middle of crowds or avoid trying new things or avoid accepting new responsibilities or, or will not complete present assignments and responsibility or avoids driving, many, many other things because there's too much anxiety. There are just too many things that could go wrong. Worry is an opportunity killer. And there's no doubt that living on a fallen planet, a lot of things can go wrong. And the problems are common to man. And that is why God has given us scores of passages to deal with this matter and how to look at the uncertainties of life. And with that, we want to look at Philippians 4, 4 to 9. And the first thing he tells us in verse 6 that we want to look at is he tells us, number one, pray right and pray thankfully. That's how you pray, right? You pray thankfully. Now, there are many profound truths about prayer in this one verse, and we're just going to look at two. He first of all tells us to pray and whether we pray or not reveals where our hope lies. A worrier is thinking to himself about problems because he is his hope. His mind is his solution. I can come up with it. I, if I can just get a handle on this, I can be at rest. I've got to go through this one more time. If only this would be, be, be true and if I could get a handle on this. He's looking to himself. 
And Paul says, you don't look to yourself here. You need to look to God. I, I want you letting your requests be made known unto God, he says. And even, however, with a worry, a lot of praying is just worrying to God. We just kind of go over our worry list in front of God. And we might even say, I gave it to God and I took it back, and I gave it to God and I took it back, and I gave it to God and I took it back. And it's wonderful that our God is so patient. And we don't trust God if we don't know Him well. And understand that this passage about praying with thanksgiving and letting our requests be made known unto God is in the context of all of this epistle of Philippians where Paul is rejoicing in prison about the kind of God he has. And you can't pray right unless you know the kind of God we have. And Paul here says, for example, in one six, he says, I am confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. He is at work, and I know he hasn't given up. And he says later in 2.13, it is God which worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. God is at work in us. He says in 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And in 4.19 he says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Paul knew some things about God that made it so that he could trust God. Then as he says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. We will be rejoicing if we really know what God is like. God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seem long. In darkness he giveth a song. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I have a Savior. I have someone who wants to save me from sin. Not just the sin of my, that results in my eternal damnation, but the sin of worry today. I looked at the cross of my Savior and said, I bowed to the will of the Master that day. And that's an important part of this we'll talk about. Then peace came and fear fled away. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens His children and purges in love. My Father knows best and I trust in His care. Through purging more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Do you see how central Jesus Christ and His Father must be in our thinking for us to pray right? Our hope can't be in us coming up with a solution in our head. Uncertain circumstances reveal where our hope is. If our hope is in ourselves, we worry. If it's in our Heavenly Father and His wonderful Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. But he says not, he doesn't just say pray. He says pray thankfully. That tests our goal in times of trouble. Again, look at Paul's ultimate goal for everything. And remember, he's in prison. They don't give him a menu to choose from of what he gets to eat and what side dishes he gets to have and what hors d'oeuvres or appetizers and what desserts and what blends of coffee he likes for dessert. I mean, this isn't happening in his life. He doesn't get to pick his roommates either. He doesn't get to, you know, he doesn't have visitors coming and no cell phone for people to visit with him. I mean, he's in prison. And listen what his goal is. 112, he says, I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me, all of this imprisonment and the beatings and everything has happened under the furtherance of the gospel. All of this happened, but I am so thankful the gospel is getting out in this, in this place. 120 and 21, he, say, he says, My desire is that Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by death or by life, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In 3.8, he says, But what things were gained to me, all of the positions and stuff I had before, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency or the highest goal of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And in 3.13 and 14, it says, But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And what is his goal? He prayed for other things, folks. He prayed for daily provisions. He prayed, we know in this book, for the healing of Epaphroditus. He prayed for the unity of the church. And he heard about some of the problems and a couple of people were having difficulty. And he's praying for their unity. 
And it's alright to pray for these things. We are to bring it by everything by prayer and supplication. We are to pray for those things. But the thanksgiving comes when we know what the overarching goal is and that even if I don't get the answer to the request I want, God will still use that hardship and that difficulty to make me more like His Son. And that's what Paul wanted. I want to know Him better and I want to be like Him more. And that can always happen. And so you can pray thankfully, he says. Jesus Christ is just wise enough to take all of our troubles and all our circumstances and make something out of it for us, for good, our good, our Christ-likeness. He's powerful enough to do that. He's, he's skilled enough to do that. He's loving enough to do that for us. God is working all things together for our good, our Christ-likeness. In everything, he says, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We are allowed to pray for dates and for grades and for money and for health and time to do important things and reconciliation of relationships and for the salvation of others and a thousand other things. But what a tragedy if God would answer those requests and leave us the same. Oh, He wants to change us. So do we pray and do we pray with thanksgiving? One of the reasons we don't pray with thanksgiving is because we are entertaining its opposite, and that is discontent. Discontent is complaint giving instead of thanksgiving. You can't be giving thanks when you're giving complaints to yourself and maybe to other people. Discontent says, I know what I really need and it's not happening. And we get into what we call if-only thinking. I know what I need, and if only I had it, if only I had that boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife, if only I had better grades or a better mind or better health or a better job or a better spouse, if only I knew whether I had cancer or some serious disease, if only I knew that I wouldn't blow the test on Friday, if only I had more control of my life, if only I had more freedom, if only I knew what was going on back home with my girlfriend, if only I knew what was going on back home with mom and dad in their marriage or with that job opportunity for the summer. I have to know. If only I had that truck or that motorcycle or that car or that house or that job. And if you're a worrier, one of the first things you can do is start making a list of all the if-onlys. Those are the things that you say, I have to have this to be satisfied. When Paul says, no, you just need God to be satisfied. And sometimes people say, I don't understand that. Well, if you think about a young couple who just got engaged, they think that way. I remember when I first got engaged, I thought, you know, we I mean, we can live in a little cracker box. It's all right. We don't need to have furniture. We'll sit on wooden crates. We'll eat macaroni and cheese every... And we did for a while. We, you know, we can eat macaroni and cheese. If that We don't need anything. We just have each other. And you know what? There's a part of that that's really right. And then you find out you do need some other things. You do need insurance and you do need your car to work and you do need some other things. But, but you know, we know what it is like to say... If I just had that person, I don't need anything else. And you know what? That's true of God. If I just had God, if I, just, if I was just knowing Him better, I wouldn't need all of this stuff. And that's true. Paul knew that. Thanksgiving has inherent in it a surrender that says, God, in my scheme of things, I think I need control of this area of my life. Or I need this thing in my life. But obviously you don't think that I need it. And I give up my demand for that control or for that thing to you. I'm thankful that you're loving enough to give me what I need when I need it. I'm thankful that you are powerful enough to give me what I need when I need it. I'm thankful that you are wise enough to give me what I need when I need it. And give me that thing if you wish. But most importantly, use this to show me where I'm not like you and how I can become like you. It has to have a surrender in it to pray right, to be thankful. That's what our Lord prayed in the garden. He said, If it be possible, Father, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. has to have that surrender. And you know what the result is? Verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds from that sin of worry through Christ Jesus, my Lord. We're screaming, I have to have control. I have to have this thing. And God is saying, No, you just need me. So the first step in dealing with anxiety is to get our hope in the right place and our goal in the right direction, the goal of Christ's likeness. Well, he tells us another thing in verse 8. He says in this verse, basically, think right. Think selectively. Think right. Think selectively. You know, if you just go around eating anything you pick up off the floor, 
you're probably going to get sick. Most of us are pretty selective about what we eat. We may eat too much or we may eat the wrong things, but we're pretty selective. We just don't go out and rummage around in the trash cans or, or go out on the campus, see what we can find on the ground out there, use candy, but you know, somebody's left a little bit of a candy bar or a piece of gum that's not fully chewed, you know, or something. We don't do that. And we have to think selectively too. And I don't have time to go through all of these words here. It's a wonderful study, but and I would encourage you to memorize the list of just whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there's virtue and there's praise, think on these things. But I just want to talk about the first one, and that is things that are true. Because a warrior doesn't spend his time thinking about things that are true. He spends his time thinking about possibilities, things that haven't even happened yet. A warrior gets involved in what we call what-if thinking. What if I don't get that grade? What if she doesn't pay any attention to me? What if mom and dad have trouble? What if the finances don't come through? What if I don't get that position? What if I don't get that boyfriend? What if, what if, what if? All of those are possibilities. Warriors meditate on possibilities instead of uncertainties. And Paul said if you want to deal with this issue, you have to meditate on the things that are true. What are the things that are true? The promises of God are always true. And Paul meditates on those in this book. The attributes of God are true. And instead of laying at night in our bed thinking about all the possibilities of things that are wrong, we need to be filling our minds in the daytime in some meditation about the promises of God and the attributes of God so we do have something selective to think about at night. You have to reject all of the possibilities, and there are an infinite number, it seems, of possibilities of things that could go wrong. And just when you think you've got an answer for all of those, you think about three more that you hadn't thought about before. You can't spend your time, if you're going to deal with anxiety, worrying about meditating on possibilities. You have to meditate on certainties. But the problem is we go to bed and we haven't ever meditated or memorized any of those. We don't have anything to think about except the uncertainties we've memorized. We have to think about the certainties, meditate on the certainties of what our God is like. If you want to attack anxiety, you have to meditate upon what is true, about mostly about our God. He is here. He loves us. He is wise. He is good. God is always good. God is always wise. God is always love. God is always here. And because of those things, we can pray with thanksgiving. Worriers spend much of their time in their own imagination. Reject those imaginations. Make a running list of your what-ifs, like you do your if-onlys. And you begin to see how much we meditate on things that aren't even true. A lot of times we just memorize verses against fear. Fear thou not. And then what does he say? Fear thou not, because I am with thee. That's what we need to meditate on. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That's the part we need to meditate on. But we just memorize verses that say, fear though not, or be anxious for nothing. And all that does is just like put, and I'm not saying that's wrong, that's like placing uh, speed limit signs out on the highway. It just tells you, you're breaking the law, you're breaking the law, you're breaking the law. It doesn't stop your car. Get the speed limit signs up so that you know when you're doing wrong, but then you've got to get some brakes. And the brakes are the right things to be thinking, the things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely. All of those things, especially about our wonderful God. Meditating on those will put the brakes on real quick. Say, well, it just seems like there's something wrong with my brain. It just keeps coming no matter what I do. There's nothing wrong with your brain except it's been habituated. It just goes that way all the time. But just like if you write your name with your right hand, you can learn to write it with your left hand. It's awkward and it feels like your brain isn't working when you write with the other hand. But it will work if you practice that enough and so will this. We have to practice rejecting the uncertainties and the possibilities and begin meditating instead upon the certainties. And lastly, he says, do right. Practice practice faithfully. Do right. Practice faithfully. That's verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. We learn best by imitation. And Paul says here, watch me. And we could expand that. And he, he would say, watch, watch Daniel, watch Joseph, watch David. Those things that you have heard and seen in them and received and learned from them, do those things. And that word means it's present active and it means continue to do that. Practice this faithfully and the God of peace shall be with you. You can't give up on this. Just like you can't give up learning to write with the other hand until you're really fluent with it. And until the normal practice of our life is to pray thankfully and to think selectively and to continue practicing that faithfully. 
we have to keep doing. Anxiety doesn't have to be a killer. There's a cure. Praying right and thinking right and, and practicing and doing right. The most crucial component, however, folks, in the cure is getting the right view of God in the picture. You can't work on anxiety without getting the view of Paul that Paul had of God in Philippians. The kind of view of God that made him rejoice in the first place. Remember when you were in kindergarten and the teacher would pass out this sheet and it had at the top of it, what's wrong with this picture? And it might be a farm picture with the pond out by the barn and um, there's a cow flying in the air and a plane is in the pond and you're to take your crayon and circle all of the things that are not supposed to be in this picture. What's wrong with this picture? What is wrong with the picture of our lives when we're worrying and anxiety? The thing that is wrong is that God is not in our picture or the wrong view of God is in the picture. And I would encourage you to take this book of Philippians. Don't just memorize 4 through 9. But meditate on all the things it teaches us about our great God. All of the certainties of who He is and what He has promised. And reject the other thoughts. He said you're to be thinking on these things.